Today, different films and television series end up producing spin-offs and sequels in an unending pattern. This was rare in the 1940s. It was extremely rare to have a single episode of a radio show produce a follow-up. Yet this is exactly what happened when Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher decided to take what is possibly the most famous Sherlock Holmes adventure and extend it beyond the original writing of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. What would happen, they asked themselves, if Sherlock Holmes was to meet up with the daughter of Irene Adler some twenty years later? Could Green and Boucher turn this into a mystery? What kind of a plot would they use to move the adventure forward? And how would Holmes and Watson react in this adventure involving the daughter of Irene Adler? Well, happily, the answer lies in the show you are about to hear. Holmes, of course, had long retired to his Sussex bee farm when he meets up with Irene's daughter. What transpires is a plot that is loosely rooted in the original A Scandal in Bohemia story, but goes beyond it in its use of characters and twist endings. What we have here is a delightful whodunit that has more surprises than you'd expect. To reveal more would do an injustice to the enjoyment of this wonderful sequel. So without further ado, here is Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Second Generation. This episode from The Life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective... Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to tell you about a wine that's just wonderful before dinner. And that wine is Petri California Sherry. You know about Sherry, of course, but do you know about Petri Sherry? That Petri Sherry is the kind of wine you can really talk about. It has the look of quality, a rich, dark amber color. And it has the aroma, the bouquet as the experts call it, of wonderful sun-ripened grapes. And flavor... Well, if you want your wine to taste good, Petri Sherry is the wine you want. It's really delicious. Oh, and incidentally, if you like your sherry on the dry side, you know, not sweet, Petri makes a pale dry sherry that's out of this world. Take home a bottle of Petri Sherry. Serve it by itself or with hors d'oeuvres or cocktail sandwiches. But serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, no, no, don't get up. You, you look much too comfortable. <laughs> Take off your overcoat and, and come and join me. Well, I enjoyed your story of a scandal in Bohemia last week, Doctor, and tonight you promised us a sequel. Yes, that's right, Mr. Bartell. A sequel that took place over 20 years afterwards, in 1909, to be exact. Sherlock Holmes was living on his Sussex bee farm. It was only in June, I remember, that I received a telegram from the great man asking me to come and spend a long weekend with him. And I'm sure you needed no urging to accept the invitation. <laughs> none, Mr. Bartell, none at all. I haven't seen Holmes for some time, and this fact, combined with my rather indifferent health, found me on the Eastbourne train a few hours after receiving the telegram. A dog cart was at the station to meet me, and after a brisk drive across the downs, I found myself once more with my good friend. He looked somewhat older than when I'd last seen him, but as he spoke to me, I realized from the keenness of his voice and the sparkle in his eye that Sherlock Holmes would never really be old. After a while, our conversation lapsed into the comfortable silence that can, exist, can pardon me, exist only between friends. And then, as the sun was setting... Holmes picked up his beloved violin and began to play some haunting melody. As he lay back, eyes half closed, his long, thin fingers caressing the instrument, a wave of nostalgia swept over me. I thought of the many years that, that we'd spent together 
and of the exciting adventures that we had shared during the old days in Baker Street. Beautiful. Quite beautiful. Thank you, Watson. <clears throat> you look uncommonly wistful, dear chap. You thinking of the old days? Yes, Holmes. I was. So was I. Uh-huh. Oh, well. Those were exciting times, but it's comforting to think that now we will not be disturbed by a jangling doorbell followed shortly by some poor devil in trouble. Nowadays, my greatest excitements are connected with the segregation of the Queen Bee and the nighttime proclivities of Charles Augustus, my tomcat. <laughs> I still find it hard to think of you in retirement, Holmes. Do you ever consider returning to active practice? Oh, I consider it occasionally and then reject the idea. A man should work only up to the peak of his ability. I'm past mine. Nonsense, Holmes. You're just as alert as ever you were. Mentally, perhaps, but not physically. Would, uh, would you consider handling a small problem <clears throat> in, uh, in England? Oh, if it's a personal problem that affects you, my dear chap, you know I'll do anything I can. Well, it's not exactly my problem, Holmes, but there was a charming... Uh, Young girl on the train. We, we got into conversation and... Uh, you don't age at any rate, old chap. You're just as susceptible as ever. No, 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 Holmes. Let me finish. She said that you knew her mother quite well. Her mother? Come in. Oh, yes, Divas. What is it? I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Holmes. Your man said I might come in. Uh, my master, Mr. Little Stanley, instructed me to deliver this note. Oh, thank you. He uh, also instructed me to wait for a reply. What confounded impudence. You tell your master that there's no answer to this letter. But he told me I must get a reply. You tell Mr. Lytton Stanley that I will instruct my solicitors to reply to his message in due course. Uh, but, sir... That's all, Devers. You may go. Very good, sir. Oh, what did the note say, Holmes? <laughs> Read it for yourself. Keep your filthy bees where they belong. One of my guests was stung yesterday. If this happens again, I'll have the police run you out of this place. Good Lord, what... An offensive letter. The man himself is even more offensive. He's a retired manufacturer who thinks that his immense wealth entitles him to domineer over the local residents. Oh, but let's not spoil a nice sunny afternoon by discussing him. Please continue with the story of the young lady that you met on the train. Yes, I'd like to. Poor little thing seems in dreadful trouble. I, I do wish you would help her. You say that she told you uh, her mother knew me? Yes. What's her name? Norton. I mean in Norton. Norton? I don't seem to recall. Oh, but of course... Where is the girl, Watson? She's staying at the Red Lion in the village. Then ring her on the telephone and ask her to come over here as fast as she can. Of course I'll help her. Oh, I'm delighted, Holmes, but uh, what made you change your mind so suddenly? Uh, is your memory so short that you can't remember Irene Adler? Surely you haven't forgotten that in the case you called a scandal in Bohemia, I was completely fooled by her? Why, Joe, yes, 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 of course. You always referred to her as the woman. But how does Irene Norton fit into the picture? Irene Adler married a barrister named Geoffrey Norton. Tell Miss Norton to come at once, Watson. She is the daughter of the woman. Mr. Holmes, I've heard so much about you from Mother. She says you're the cleverest man in England. <laughs> Your mother flatters me, my dear child. She herself was much more clever than I. In fact, it... Uh, yes. <laughs> did she ever tell you about the, uh, the circumstances under which we met? No, Mr. Holmes, though she did tell me that you were a witness when she and my father were married. <laughs> very true, my dear, very true. Though the occasion was a little, uh, well, shall we say unusual? Look here. This, uh, golden sovereign I wear on my watch chain is a memento of that day. I also have a charming photograph of your mother. You must have known her quite well. <clears throat> how, how about telling Mr. Holmes about your troubles, my nephew? Yes. <laughs> Reminiscences are charming, but they can wait until we've dealt with your problems. Mr. Holmes, I'm being blackmailed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, by whom? By a neighbor of yours, Mr. Lytton Stanley. Do you know him? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed I do. As a matter of fact, Mr. Holmes received a most offensive note from the gentleman less than an hour ago. Uh, what hold does Mr. Stanley have over you, my dear? He has some letters, some rather indiscreet letters of mine that I wrote to a friend of his last year. How did he obtain these letters, Miss Norton? He must have stolen them. I don't know how, but when I was staying at his house a few weeks ago, he told me that he had them and asked 5,000 pounds for their return. Oh, gracious me. And um, why should he consider your letters even indiscreet letters? Worth so large a sum. I'm engaged to be married to Lord Weston's son. 
That awful man didn't Stanley knows that if my fiancé saw the letters, the marriage would never take place. They must be extremely compromising. Oh, they aren't, really. But I was much younger when I wrote them. In fact, I was only 17, and I'm afraid they could easily be misconstrued. Have you told your mother? Oh, no, she'd never understand. Hmm. She might surprise you on that score, I think. <laughs> how about your father? Daddy's a barrister. You can imagine how straight-laced he'd be about the whole thing. That's why I came to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I see. You, uh, you feel that I am not so, uh, well, should we say, straight-laced? Of course you aren't. Mother's told me about you, and in any case, I've read Dr. Watson's story. Watson, my dear fellow? Your stories will land me in serious trouble one of these days. Uh, what are you suggesting Mr. Holmes can do for you, Miss Norton? Get the letters back for me. <laughs> but how? Steal them, of course. Well, really, my dear, I hardly think you can... No, 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 my dear Watson, don't be shocked. Oh, Miss Norton is a forthright girl like her mother before her. It's most refreshing. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you can't say you won't help me. No, I don't think that I can say it. In any case, I have a slight personal score to settle with Mr. Lippin Stanley myself. He's rude and has no understanding of bees. But how are you going to steal the letters? That problem requires a little thought, old chap. I can tell you how to do it, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? This is delightful, my dear. You explain the problem and also the way of solving it. How easy a detective's work might be if all clients were equally helpful. Tell me, what is your plan? Tomorrow is a servant's half day off at Mr. Lytton Stanley's. He'll be alone there during the afternoon. Uh, how do you know that fact? My maid was keeping company, as they say, with Divas, the butler, when I was staying there a few weeks ago. She found out everything from him. My letters are kept in a filigree box in his desk. With your enterprise, my dear, I'm surprised that you didn't try and open the desk yourself. I did. But it's very sturdy and has a combination lock. Oh. However, I'm sure that you and Dr. Watson can think of some way of getting the letters, particularly if Mr. Lytton Stanley's alone in the house. Uh, we shall do our best, Miss Morton. Promise me one thing, though, both of you. Oh, what's that? Don't read the letters, will you? I, I, I'm really rather ashamed of writing them. Oh, of course we won't, my dear child. You're both so sweet to me. How can I thank you? <laughs> Thanks would be a little premature, but... Um, you could do us a favor. Of course. What is it? Your mother had a beautiful voice, I recall. I, uh, I wonder if you inherit her talent. I do sing, though I've never done so professionally, like mother. And I've never played the violin professionally, but perhaps uh, between us we could give Watson a little concert. That's a delightful idea. We can't do anything until tomorrow anyway. Uh, what would you like to sing? <laughs> Songs my mother Really, really remarkably appropriate. In the days long vanished, seldom from her. Charming. Tonight, music, and tomorrow, a touch of daylight robbery. Dear old Watson, your disguise is really excellent. Oh, I must confess, I'm a little apprehensive. I will, Jap. There's no need to be, I assure you. You, as Dr. Hamish, and I, as the Reverend Appleby, are calling on Mr. Lytton Stanley ostensibly in search of a contribution for my charity hospital that you are in charge of. What could be simpler? Well, what made you decide on the, on the role of a clergyman? It should simplify our entrance into the house. Now, hmm? I must confess that a rare touch of sentiment prompted the choice of my disguise. Oh, how does sentiment enter into it? Oh, surely you remember that it was in the role of a simple-minded nonconformist clergyman that I once attempted to deceive Miss Norton's mother? That's right. <laughs> I'd forgotten. That woman really fascinates you, doesn't yeah, she? she does, old chap. <laughs> Irene Adler was uh, one woman I've always regarded with unbounded admiration. Even though she was a criminal. But the map of this, come on, old fellow. Are you ready? Yes. You have the equipment I mentioned to you? In my pocket. And let's be off, old chap. Let's be off. Hmm. If he's home, why the devil doesn't he answer the door? Oh, come, 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 my dear Reverend Appleby, for a parson, your language is, is hardly appropriate. I'm sorry, Dr. Hamish. Here comes someone. Yes? Mr. Lytton Stanley. That's my name. And mine is Appleby, and this is my friend, Dr. Hamish. I'm proud to meet you, sir. I've heard a great deal about you. What can I do for you? If we could come in for a moment, I'll explain our mission. Oh, uh, very well. Come into the study. 
We're raising a subscription list for a charity hospital at Paddlewake, just across the Downs. You're a prominent resident here, and we thought that you'd like to donate a few guineas. I'm really not very interested. I've given as much to charity this year as I can afford. Well, it's a fine call, sir. I'm giving my medical services three days a week, and the Reverend Appleby is donating his services too. Who else has contributed to this fund? All your neighbors, sir. We just came from the bee farm over the downs. The owner, Mr. Holmes, gave us a check for five guineas. Mm. Holmes gave you five guineas, did he? Aye, a very nice gentleman, Mr. Holmes. We're proposing to name a ward in the hospital after him. Is this list of subscribers going to be published in the paper? Oh, yes, oh, yes, Mr. Litton Stanley. I'll give you ten guineas. Ten guineas? Thank you, sir. Very kind of you, sir, I'm sure. I'll uh, get my checkbook. It's in this desk. Good, Watson. The platform. Right. Now, uh, uh, who do I make this check payable to? <coughs> Hold him still, Holmes. Hold him still. Very neat, Watson. Chloroform doesn't take long, does it? Little, it, little, little old fellow. He's lying over the desk. That's it. Is the filigree box in there? Uh-huh. Here it is. Splendid. Holmes, don't open it. You promised that you wouldn't. I just wish to make sure to that... Make sure... Uh, who was the... there, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Who, who the... Oh, no, don't move. I have a revolver, and don't turn round. Place the box on the table, Mr. Holmes. And put your hands up, gentlemen, both of you. That's right. I know that voice. It's Devers, the butler. Uh, quite correct, sir. Well, Devers, you needn't point a revolver at us. Your, your master isn't injured. I'm not in the least interested in my master's health, Dr. Watson. In fact... If he were dead, I should be delighted. Now, what are you up to, Devers? I'm taking advantage of a situation, sir. I've been trying to open that desk for weeks. After such kindness on your part, sir, I hate to seem ungracious, but I'm dreadfully afraid I shall have to kill you. Uh, to kill both of you. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second, so... I'm just going to remind you that good food always tastes better when served with good wine. And if you like a red wine, say with steak or meat of any kind, you'll love Petri California Burgundy. If you'd rather have a white wine, say with chicken or fish, then by all means get Petri California Sauterne. Oh, and look, if opinion is divided in your family, if some of you like a red wine and some like white, the answer's obvious. Don't buy one, buy two. Remember that, huh? Don't buy one... Buy two, but do buy Petri. Then you know it's good. Well, Doctor, that was a fine place to break off your story with the butler pointing a gun at your backs and you and Sherlock Holmes with your hands above your heads. What happened next? I know at least you didn't get killed. You wouldn't be sitting here in California tonight telling me the story. Elementary, my dear Mr. Bartell, (laughs) but supposing I take you back in the story to the point where I left off. Well, all right then. Take me back, Doctor. Take me back. Very well. We stood there, Holmes and I, our hands above our heads. As Devers said... I can't tell you how grateful I am that you opened the desk for me. After such kindness on your part, sir, I hate to seem ungracious, but I'm dreadfully afraid I'm going to have to kill you both. Uh, Devers, I dislike to appear stupid at such a melodramatic moment, but why is it necessary to kill us? Uh, For months, I have been waiting for an opportunity to steal the Kitman Jar Emerald, and now you have done it for me, sir. And presented me with a perfect alibi. A Kitman Jar Emerald? Oh, come now, Mr. Holmes. You know the treasures in this house as well as I do. Apart from the Emerald, there's a superb Cellini that would fetch a fine price in the right market. We aren't here after any valuables, my good man. Please don't call me your good man, Dr. Watson. It's patronizing and untrue. In any case, sir, whether you were here after the valuables or not makes no difference. I've caught you both red-handed. You're completely in my power, gentlemen. You're going to steal the treasures, I suppose, and then pretend that we were responsible. Exactly, sir. Mm -hmm. I shall kill you both, secrete what objects appeal to me, and when my master regains consciousness, I shall explain that I found three men burgling the house, that I killed two of them while the third got away with the loot. Who will be able to doubt my word? I shall be regarded as a hero. (laughs) I might even have my salary raised. Uh, Watson, I'm afraid this is the end, old chap. What a sordid way to die. Shot the back like a coward. A diva's... At least do us the courtesy of allowing us to face the firing squad, will you? Very well, gentlemen. Turn round. But don't try any tricks. One last request. Uh, what is it, sir? I'm beaten, and I admit it. I'm getting old, but in my heyday I've crossed swords with some of the greatest criminals in Europe. My life has been attempted many times, but I've always escaped. If this is to be my swan song, at least give me the privilege of shaking the hand of a man who has at last bested me. Well, sir, I... 
feel that I'm stepping a little out of my station, but I suppose the situation is unusual. I hope you don't object to the left hand, sir. I'll keep the revolver in my right. Very well, Devers. There you are. Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, Devers, and my congratulations. What? My congratulations for being a fool. Well done, Holmes. Maybe getting old, Watson, but I've not lost my skill at that, too. Uh, he went over your shoulder in a flash. Fortunately, the bullet went wide. Where is he, Watson? Struck the desk as he fell. Yes, he's gashed his head. It's not serious. He'll be unconscious for a while. Good, but I think we'll take the precaution of closing this desk drawer. I don't want him to be exposed to further temptation when he comes to. Here we are. Well, shouldn't we get in touch with the police, Holmes? Police? Great Scott, no, old fellow. After all, we're burglars and we're in disguise. Two facts that would be hard to explain satisfactorily. No, Watson, we must get back to the bee farm as soon as possible. Yes, I suppose you're right. Miss Norton will be waiting for us there and we'll tell her what's happened. Poor girl, I'm afraid she's in for something of a shock. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm so glad to see you back again. Did you get the filigree box? Yes, Miss Norton, here it is. But, Holmes, I didn't know that you... Miss Watson, uh, why not open it, Miss Norton? Well, I... I uh... Open it, my dear. There may not be love letters inside it, but there's a note. Oh. Why don't you read it to us? Well, let this be a warning, Miss Norton. Crime does not pay. If you don't believe me, ask your mother. Sincerely, Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, you knew my secret all the time. Not all the time, but I realized it as soon as I'd opened the filigree box. What on earth are you talking about? Miss Norton was under the impression that she could use me as a cat's paw, as a dupe to commit a burglary for her. I still don't understand, Holmes. You will remember she asked us to promise not to open the box. Yes, but you did, sir, just before the fellow held us up with a revolver. What was inside the box? An impressive green stone which I knew to be the Kitmanja Emerald. But where is the emerald now? I slipped it back into Mr. Lytton Stanley's desk and locked it. Brought the box here because I wanted to see your expression, Miss Norton, as you opened it. Great, Scott, and I thought you were a poor little thing in trouble. Shocking. What do you have to say for yourself, young lady? That I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Holmes, terribly sorry. It seemed like a wildly exciting idea, but I didn't really mean to steal it. No, of course not. No, no, of course you didn't. You meant me to steal it for you. Miss Norton, I'm convinced you knew that your mother once outwitted me and you presumed to think that you could do the same. I should turn you over to the police. Please don't, Mr. Holmes. You can't do that. I certainly could. But I'm not going to for two reasons. First, you're young and impressionable, and this may teach you a lesson. And in the second place, I have a strange admiration for your mother. But I warn you, Miss Norton, that you have had a narrow escape. A very narrow escape. Mr. Holmes, before I go, there's one favor I want to ask you. Really? What is it? Could I keep this filigree box with your note inside it? It would be a reminder all my life of how we met. Ah, what do you say, Watson? Well, it isn't your box to give, Holmes. That's true, old fellow. That's quite true. But I fail to see how we can return it now without disclosing our own share in the attempted robbery. In any case, I don't like Mr. Lytton Stanley. I think we might indulge in a little petty larceny without uh, feeling too guilty. Very well, Miss Norton. You may keep the box. I shall always treasure it. Thank you. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. Don't think too badly of me. Mm. Goodbye. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You know, Holmes, I must say you were surprisingly lenient with that girl. Do you suppose her mother put her up to the whole thing? That possibility had occurred to me, old fellow. And yet I have a feeling that... Come in. Doors open. Were you expecting anyone? No. Great Scott, it's Lytton Stanley. Good evening, sir. This is an unexpected honor. Sherlock Holmes, we haven't been the best of friends, I know. But you've got to help me now. I'm in serious trouble. Oh, indeed, sir. Won't you sit down? This is my friend, Dr. Watson. How, How do, you do, do you do? And now, sir... Now, what is your trouble? I've been robbed, Holmes. Robbed? What was stolen? Well, my greatest treasure, the Kipman Jar Emerald, was removed from his case and then mysteriously returned loose in my desk afterwards. But there's a priceless Cellini missing. Have you, uh... Have you any idea who the burglars might be? Oh, it was a gang, I'm sure of that. A couple of disguised as a clergyman and a doctor came into the house on the pretext of raising money for some hospital. 
And they overpowered me with chloroform. Oh, dear me, dear me. How very unpleasant for you. Yes, well, when I came to, I found my butler, Devers, lying beside me in a pool of blood. The brave fellow had wrestled with the thieves, but they got away. And he's in the hospital now. Holmes, you've got to help me. The Kipman Jar Emerald was returned, you say, but a, a Cellini is missing. Yes. It's an exquisite filigree box in which I'd kept the emerald. A filigree box? Yes, it's a genuine Cellini. It's worth several thousand pounds. Holmes, you must help me solve this business. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Lytton Stanley, but I'm afraid I can't help you. I've retired. <clears throat> yes, and I intend to remain in retirement. <laughs> Good night, sir. Oh, but I'll pay you any fee within reason. My decision is final, sir. Good night. Oh, I might have known I wouldn't get any help from you. Holmes, she fooled you again. Yes, yes the little devil. She knew that box was a Cellini all the time. You don't seem very angry with her over Ah, uh, I should be, but I'm not. What splendid audacity. What a superb nerve the child has. But you must get the box back from her. I shall, Watson. I shall. Or rather, I shall persuade Divas to do it for me. As the price of our silence. But how can he get it back? Remember that he walks out with Miss Norton's maid. I'm certain that when he explains his predicament, he can prevail upon her to steal the box from her mistress so that it may be returned to its rightful owner. That's a good idea. By George Holmes, Miss Norton's a chip off the old block, all right. Yes, Watson, she is, and it makes me wonder. What about? <laughs> I wonder, my dear chap, how long I can remain in retirement with such a worthy antagonist at large. It's a challenge. It's an irresistible challenge. <laughs> You know, Dr. Watson, I, I just can't get over the way you and Mr. Holmes let that girl, uh, Irene, was that her name, pull the wool over your eyes. Boy, she really twisted you around her little finger. Well, Mr. Bartell, I, I don't like to make extremely positive statements, but I'm sure that if you were in my shoes, Irene would not only have twisted you around her little finger... But she'd have had you rolling about in hoops and standing on your head. <laughs> you mean she was that beautiful? Mr. Bartell, she was so beautiful that she'd make you forget all about Petri wine. Dr. Watson, no girl is that beautiful. Oh, how young you really are. Well, maybe so, but there are lots of pretty girls in this world and only one Petri wine. That's because there's only one Petri family that's been making wine since the 1800s. And believe me, because the Petri business has always been family-owned and operated, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the highly skilled art of making fine wine. And those generations of winemaking add up to a lot of experience. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why, no matter what type of wine you wish, you can't go wrong looking for the label that says... P-E-T-R-I. Petri. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, is the day before Christmas. So I'm going to tell you an adventure that took place many years ago and involved Holmes and myself in one of the most fantastic Christmas Eve situations in which we ever found ourselves. I think you'll like the story. I call it... The night before Christmas. It sounds swell, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, before I go, Mr. Bartell, I'd, I'd like to remind our listeners there's no better way to spend money than to spend it on Christmas seals. Every penny spent on Christmas seals not only helps cure tuberculosis, but it also helps prevent it right in your own community. Your purchases of Christmas seals in the past have saved thousands of lives. Keep saving lives. Buy all the Christmas seals you can afford this year. Now, uh, won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. And Mr. Bruce, through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Basil Rathbone's new Columbia record album, Robin Hood, is now available at your music store.
The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family.